Good afternoon, everybody. I'm taking my watch off because I have 25 minutes and no more. And so I have to be extremely vigilant about how we use the time. First, it's wonderful to be in the gallery. And Andrew's just been, the last time I was here was for the Picasso, which was spectacular. And it's wonderful to see the, the depth and breadth of Australian visual art. And to know that music is slowly catching up. Music will never catch up with all the other arts. Music is always the last of the art forms to reach a particular period. So when we're talking about classical literature and classical painting, that was well before classical music. When we talk about late Renaissance in music, that was well before the late Renaissance in art. Music is the slowest, and that's not necessarily a bad thing or a good thing. It's simply a fact. Music operates that way. Of all the genre in music, the most conservative is opera. Opera audiences are notoriously conservative. Most opera audiences want to see Boheme and Traviata on alternate nights. I run an opera company in Melbourne known as Victorian Opera, and one of the things I do is commission new Australian work. I've always been interested in new Australian work, commissioning new work, and being involved in new work. And the first big piece in which I was involved was The Eighth Wonder, which was the opera by Alan John and Dennis Watkins, devoted to the stories surrounding the building of the Sydney Opera House. That was a very interesting opera because it involved lots of legal issues. So initially, when we looked at the libretto and we had Utzon and Davis Hughes and various other people, the laws of libel prevented the composer and the librettist from using those names. So they had to become archetypes. So they were known as the maestro, the premier, the, the singer, etc. The story, one day, about this opera house will be written properly. And all the shocking truths that have come out gradually about this building will be known. I've worked in all the major halls, and there is nothing pleasant about any of them. <laughs> certainly not being in the opera pit. It's not pleasant for the musicians, and it's certainly not pleasant for the conductor who has great difficulty in hearing the pit. So this opera of Alan's and Dennis's dealt with lots of those problems, and it drew on some spectacular information. It drew on the great myth about the sails. Now, are you aware of the myth of the sails, it's a myth. The tourist guys will tell you, one day Utzon watched somebody peeling an orange into quarters, and that was how he got the idea from the sails. That's a myth, all right? If you look at the original drawings, they're nothing like that. The original drawings have the sails as very, very long and flat. This is a complete myth. The other one, or well, not the other one, but the serious issue in all of this opera, which was made very clear in the piece, was that the, the opera hall was never meant to be where it is. The opera hall was meant to be the big hall, and the concert hall a secondary hall. But the way that was dealt with was spectacular, and you need to read Hansard for all those details. And in the end, it, a very unfortunate remark was made by a politician who said to Utzon, why do we need an opera house? Who wants opera? Only a few pufters and Jews. That's a quote. That is a quote. An extraordinary remark from coming from the basis which keeps us in the cultural backwater. We fought very hard to get this opera on and it is to Moffat Oxenbold, who was then artistic director's credit, that we did it. And we actually played it twice. 
We played this opera twice, which is extraordinary to have new life in a, or a second performance of an opera. The next opera dealt with a very different topic, and it was the topic of Lindy, the Lindy Chamberlain story. And people kept saying, why do you want to write an opera about Lindy Chamberlain? What's operatic about that? Well, I'll tell you what's operatic about it. There are two things that don't work well on stage. One is a static circumstance, a monologue, which goes forever and ever and ever, Siegfried, for example, or a courtroom drama, very hard on stage. And Lindy had two courtroom dramas, the first trial in which she was convicted, and the second, the inquiry. The reason I championed Lindy very hard, very, very hard. Four directors walked from that project. There were four directors who would not touch it. They said, it's too hard, too difficult, the score's too long, and I said, we can cut the score, which we did. And Moya Henderson and I, uh, we agree not to speak to each other again about cutting the score. But one of the most important things about new work is to know where to cut. There's information in new work which is not interesting to a general public. And Moyer and I had quite significant battles about that. And there was a famous scene about how they were stopped at Mount Isa to fill the car with petrol so that they could actually make the drive from Mount Isa to Ayers Rock. And it was quite a big scene. And I said, Moyer, this isn't interesting. Filling a car with petrol doesn't grab me dramatically. Even driving through the desert is less interesting. Let's cut that scene. And she said, I love that scene. And I said, you're the only one who does. So no one else is going to love it. The thing is, the bits you cut out of your work are the bits you like best. And she said, I will never forgive you for that. And she didn't. But it was the truth. What was interesting about Lindy was it brought to light all those hideous cartoons that the, the Sydney Sun published in such incredible detail in the first trial. Now, unless you knew about those cartoons, they disappear very quickly. Cartoons are daily. Cartoons are not like these. You look at a cartoon, you think, why is that funny? Well, it's only funny really on the day. But these cartoons were not funny. These cartoons were cruel. And there was one with a dingo holding a baby, and the caption was, they taste delicious, but they're very hard to peel. And that was a cartoon on the sun. That was in the Sydney sun. And there were lots like that. And people said, you're not going to show that stuff. And I said, yes, we are. It's really important that people, she was tried by the press. Lindy was guilty before she even walked into the court in everybody's mind. The importance of the work was to bring to the general public the idea that this woman had been seriously maltreated and that Judith Rodriguez and Moy Henderson bravely took on the idea that they would, through a dramatic means, vindicate, have Lindy vindicated. Lindy came to the rehearsals, as did Michael, Michael Chamberlain, and the children. And Lindy sat in the rehearsal room. And she discussed, for example, we had a scene which she hugged a guard when she was in Berrimah Jail. And Lindy turned to the director who was Stuart Mourner and said, I would never hug a screw. <laughs> which, of course, is the word for guard. And so, OK, we dropped that. But it was very interesting to watch Lindy's reaction to this. And she was, in every sense of the word, thrilled that a case was being made through drama, through the medium of opera, which was exciting public attention. And of course, it's just all flowered again. That was a very interesting project. People said it would be a dog and it would never work, and I just kept on and on and on. And in the end, we had four completely sold-out nights. 
which for a new work is extraordinary. In a Benjamin Britten opera, three acts. First act, house three quarters full. Second act, house half full. Third act, orchestra and 10 people in the front row. And that's Britain. So for contemporary opera, that was extraordinary. I was then involved in two more really interesting pieces. One, The Ghost Wife by Jonathan Mills and Dorothy Porter, and then Eternity Man. I'll deal with The Ghost Wife. The Ghost Wife is a very significant part of Australian history. It deals with a story by Barbara Bainton. And Barbara Bainton, as you know, was an author writing at the turn of the last century about women and their place in Australia, but particularly in the bush. And what Barbara Bainton was trying to do was to say that the romance of the bush was a myth, that the idea of a woman marrying a farmer who would then take her to a property and they'd have this beautiful farm and there'd be gorgeous fruit trees and they'd have lots of beautiful children, etc., etc. It was wrong. It was not just wrong, it was crazy. That was never going to happen. And she wrote this, the story was called The Chosen Vessel. And Dot Porter and uh, Jonathan agreed to call it The Ghost Wife, which I think was actually a good choice. There are three principles. The wife, the swagman, and the husband. And the opera opens with the swagman abusing his wife. He goes off, I beg your pardon, the husband, the farmer, abusing his wife. He goes off and says, make sure everything is fixed up by the time I get home and don't be a miserable, snivelling, blah, blah, blah. She sings then of, you promised me that when we came here, there'd be a, an apple tree, there'd be an orange tree, and we would do this and this, none of this happens. She has a baby during, obviously she was pregnant prior to his going away, she has the baby and a swagman visits the house. And the swagman is malevolent and has clearly evil intentions towards her. She is terrified. What was interesting about this was Jonathan designed a house for her to live in which was all percussion instruments. So the wall of the house could be played the roof of the house could be played and the garden wall could be played. So during the opera, when the swagman comes back for his fatal visit, percussionists climbed on the roof of the house and banged, which terrified the life out of this woman in the house. And there were wires that they played, which were electronic, which hummed. And we, the lighting effects were quite extraordinary. We had a guy in Melbourne called Blue Bottle who lit this piece for us. And just prior to her being murdered, the house collapses with the percussionists on it and the entire thing fell onto the stage. All that was left is her body and the baby in the corner. To which the husband returns, sees the house destroyed, looks at the baby, picks the baby up, which is still alive, and makes the decision that he has no choice other than to look after this baby, end of opera. That played in three festivals, and then we were finally invited to do it in London, which we did. We played it in the Barbican in the pit, in the Barbican. And you know, the pit in the Barbican is where they put the bodies after the plague. So it was very interesting to be in a, a place where death was paramount, to be doing this very black piece. The other piece of Jonathan and Dorothy's, which I godfathered and conducted, was Eternity Man, about Arthur Stace, who wrote Eternity All Over Sydney. When I was a child in the Paleolithic period, I used to go to school by train from Epping to Eastwood. And often at Eastwood Station, you get out and there was Eternity written on the station wall or on the footpath. And we used to copy it. We used to practice writing his E because it was always the same. And this particular opera dealt with the way in which Stace was converted. And the story centred on the idea that Stace, who ostensibly was an alcoholic and who had a sister who ran a brothel, uh, was walking past a church in Regent Street Sydney, 
heard a choir and went in and heard, and I am yours to eternity. And that was the word that got him, that converted him. And his sister, whom they call Myrtle in the opera, ran this particular um, brothel, had a trio of girls working in the brothel. And Dorothy Porter came up with the idea that these girls would recite the names of the suburbs that Arthur Stace visited, because it was all over Sydney. It wasn't just here at, you know, at Town Hall Station or Wynyard, it was all over Sydney. He would write Eternity. And there was, of course, Paddington, Wallara, Manly, Cronulla, Eastwood, Horns. He named all of these places that he visited. The story had no real narrative in the sense of he's a beginning, a middle and end, but rather the way in which people reacted to this concept. So in, when you look at Eight Wonder, Lindy, Ghost Wife and Eternity Man, there are no common themes. All of the librettists and the composers are attracted by widely differing subjects, leaning to one I did last year, based on Kathy Lett's story, How to Kill Your Husband and Other Handy Household Hints. <coughs> Pardon me. Now, that was another one people said, why are you doing a Kathy Lett story? So, I know Kathy very well. And when she wrote that book, I said, Kathy, this is the first book you've written with a storyline. There's actually a plot in this. And it was very interesting how Tim Daly, the librettist, got hold of this story, modified it to Kathy's approval. Alan John, who wrote The Eighth Wonder, also wrote this. And we got this extraordinary opera dealing with these wild suburban characters. So we had a sex therapist, a husband and wife who are very much out of love. He's a vet and she's a school teacher. They both go to a sex therapist. And the sex therapist was played by Krista Hughes of the band Machine Gun Fellatio. And that was a very raunchy scene. And we had all sorts of these, and people said, oh, this, you know, you're going to do this opera for an audience in Melbourne, of all places. And I said, Melbourne needs to grow up. And it needs to see things like this. Melbourne needs to know about this. And it was very interesting. People were very worried about this, this particular opera. We went ahead, we sold out 12 performances, completely sold out. Kathy Lett, as you can imagine, was like a publicity magnet. Like, you, there were journalists in the rehearsal room day and night. And opening night, Kylie Minogue was there and Barry Humphrey, it was extraordinary. And it, as far as I'm concerned, it was great for the opera company. What was interesting was the piece worked. It worked as a piece of drama. And the boy who designed it was Jasper Knight. One of, Sid, one of Australia's great painters. And people said, why are you using Jasper to do this? I said, Jasper is an Australian artist. He'll have a view on the story, but he's not a set designer. I said, I'm not employing him as a set designer. We'll give him an assistant who can do the hard yakka. I want Jasper to come up with a concept. And he did. It was spectacular. The concept was spectacular. That is huge swimming pool suspended from the back of the stage and he had designed the front of the stage like a uterus, fallopian tubes, etc., etc., and going up to the womb where the band was. So the band was in the womb, so to speak. And people said, that's outrageous. I said it's called How to Kill Your Husband and Other Handy Household Hints. It doesn't get more outrageous than that. <clears throat> and what was interesting was our subscribers give us feedback all the time. And I was standing in the foyer one night with a very, very elderly patron, very elderly patron, and she said, well, I've had three husbands and I've disposed of them and now I've found a fourth way. <laughs> it was a big risk doing this particular opera. But 
It was a risk that paid off. It was another Australian story we could tell in our particular way. We paralleled that with a Patrick White story, The Cockatoos. Sarah Dionne and Sarah Carradine. Sarah Dionne directed, uh, wrote the music. Sarah Carradine directed it. And it was in the season I called The Year of the Woman. I had 2010, I called The Year of the Woman because I had women directors, women designers, all sorts of, was deliberately, deliberately saying, males have dominated the stage for years and years and years. Let's find really good women, not tokenistically, but find good women who can design, direct, conduct, and so on, which we did. This story of Patrick White's, the novella, is very bloody, because it involves a child killing a bird. And it has to be a child. And it's the very good reason for him killing the cockatoo. Nowadays, because we are so politically correct, we had to submit the script to the Department of Child Welfare, which we do every, every opera I do, which has a child under the age of 15, I have to submit the script. And the child, the department goes through the script and they come back to me and they have it all underlined. So when we did Turn of the Screw, which is not an Australian story, but I had two children in it, I, there was nearly a day of answering questions about Turn of the Screw. The funniest was the little sweep. When we did the little sweep of Benjamin Green, because it says the character Sammy, who's the little sweep, Sammy cries. And the question was, who made Sammy cry? <laughs> who will be there to comfort Sammy? Then, Sammy falls out of the chimney. How does Sammy fall? Is he pushed? And I said, not until I push you first. <laughs> but pages and pages and pages of questions. But we finally convinced them that the child who had to perform the act of killing the bird would not be psychologically damaged. But we, have to, we had to question them. And we had to question them in front of the parents. But it's a, really, it's an, it's a story about Ramwick. It's a story about the cockatoos in Ramwick opposite where Patrick Wright lived. In the same program, we had another story called The Parrot Factory, which was a bird balance. It was a crazy story by Ross Bagland and Stuart Greenbaum about a lost treasure, and the only person who knows where the lost treasure happens to be a parrot. And the parrot has been taught what to say to a particular response. So when the parrot's given a keyword, it'll say where the treasure is. That was a youth opera project. Next week, we open probably our most adventurous Australian story yet, and that's Midnight Sun, which is by Louis Nara and Gordon Kerry, the libretto by Nara and the music by Kerry. It deals with the corp murder. Does that ring a bell with anyone? It's interesting. It was the famous body in the boot, Shrine of Remembrance. So, I'm not doing it for that reason, and I'm going on John Fane on Monday in Melbourne on 774, and I know I will be pilloried by thousands of people ringing in saying, why are you doing an opera about a body in a boot? That's not why we're doing the opera about the body in a boot, it's not about that. The opera is about how humans relate one to the other when love goes wrong, when people make wrong choices. They're the great themes. So our Australian stories cover a multitude of themes, but central, central to all of these, operatically, is the concept of love. Even in How to Kill Your Husband, it was love going wrong. The cockatoos, there is a love element in the cockatoos. And in this story, it's about human beings who find themselves entrapped and they don't know how to deal with it other than to deal with it severely. And that's why I'm doing it. Because it is important for our composers and our librettists to learn about the craft of writing for a stage in a particular way. Brett Dean's opera Bliss is another example of that, but on a huge scale, a very different scale from the sorts of things we do, which are basically chamber. 
And the reason I make them chamber is we can afford to do them and it gives a librettist and a composer a limit. If you say to a composer, you've got an 80-piece orchestra, a 48-voice chorus, 18 principals, and the budget's seven million dollars. Nothing will happen. <laughs> but if you say you've got five instrumentalists, it's got to be 70 minutes, and you have three characters, and they can double up, you often get very, very good work. A non-Australian story was Andrew Ford and Sue Smith in exactly that example. When Andrew said, can I have this and this and this? He said, no. You can have that and that and that and that's that. There is no more money. And so it's wonderful, actually, to work within the very, very strong confines of a limited budget, a limited cast and a limited orchestra. And then you bring in a wonderful lighting designer and we don't go now with costume. And what you get is generally good singing good story and we get very strong reaction and our public tell us very strongly how they feel about what we do with new work and what's very interesting when I started with this new work people said people don't want to see, I was told by a northern socialite people don't want to see new work now first of all the remark is completely stupid because how does she know and I did ask her, how do you know? And I said, people will come and see all sorts of things, provided you do it in a way which is convincing and will encourage them to come back. And I believe we do that and we do get it. We've, we've started to build an audience for Australian chamber opera. And they tell us when they like it and they tell us when they don't. And that's fine. It's a free world. We want that sort of information. So while ever I can, I will continue to tell Australian stories through music and through opera and encourage Australian composers and librettists. And I will always remember to keep my talk to 25 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you.